I uh, appreciate getting to be with you guys. Uh, I, I want to ask you, did your dad ever tell you to take speech class when you were in high school? Yes. How about in college? Yes. And were you too scared to talk publicly to take speech class? No. Well, that was me. So if you can imagine yourself in that mode, and then you follow everybody that's presented in front of me, you can realize if I look like I'm shaking, I probably am. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that as we come to a meeting like this, we're always trying to learn something. And uh, I think the best way that I can get acquainted with you guys is to have you hear my story a little bit. And when I was a little boy, I lived in a big town of about 1,800 people, and I only had one dream. That was to play in the NBA. <laughs> so I remember the little black and white TV that was actually a giant big box that you sit on the floor and you turn the knob so you had to scoot up real close to change the channels. And I, I could see NBA players playing on that TV and I thought that's what I want to do. And I'm pretty fortunate that I, I got referred to the other day as a professional athlete because I took on a 13 year old in a game of indoor basketball and I beat him really bad. And he told his mom, he said, I think I could take him. And she explained to me that she shared with him that it would be a while because I was a professional athlete. <laughs> so anyway, maybe I have reached my dream. <laughs> it's interesting how basketball, uh, I, I kind of knew my limit at the point where I thought I was really good in the eighth grade because I was already five foot 10. But by the ninth grade, and particularly the 11th grade, and all the rest of them were as tall as me, I realized that no matter how good you shoot, if you're not fast enough to guard anybody, you get to sit next to the coach. <laughs> but I was very lucky that my dad became a golf addict when I was about 11. And so much so that I got my first club at 10 or 11 years old, but this little town we lived in didn't have a course. And he rode the freight train from southern Missouri to Memphis. So he decided if we'd move 25 miles up the road where there was a nine-hole country club, he would drive to work instead of driving to golf. And that would be better for him. So we moved up the road to the big city of West Plains, Missouri. Uh, it was about 5,000 people, so it had a big school and a golf course. and. I started playing golf when I was about 12. Well, when I was 13, my dad and I were playing a scramble tournament. And that was a big deal because by then, he had dropped his average score from 100 to 90. And I was getting better. And as a scramble team, as good as I putted, we could make some pars and birdies. I have no idea how we got this pairing, but we paired with a fellow by the name of Ken Lanning. And Mr. Lanning was bigger than life. And it turns out that he went to my dad after that round and he said, if you would like, I will coach your son. Well, we didn't really know what that meant, but Mr. Lanning lived 100 miles north of us in a town called Rolla, Missouri. He earned a living selling real estate, but he is known, and, and he has passed away, but he's known as Mr. Junior Golf in the state of Missouri. And if you lived in southern Missouri, chances are you got in front of him for lessons because he come to all the junior tournaments and would be there when you got done to help you. He might help your parents while you were on the course and then he'd help you when you got done. He would take us to tournaments. He would organize trips. He would take us to nice dinners. But it's interesting, I stand up here now and the one thing I can promise you is I know the least of all the speakers because I have not pursued knowing everything. I've stayed in my lane of realizing that Mr. Lanning taught me things that the more technology comes out and proves, I believe they're validating what I learned as a kid. And I would say my niche in the golf world was I took that desire to be a basketball player, 
And I don't know if you thought of this when you were eight years old, but I realized if I could shoot a left-handed shot and make a left-handed shot at eight years old, I would never lose a horse game. Because <laughs> my friend wouldn't take, the, wouldn't take the time to learn how to shoot a left-handed shot. And I would make him shoot left-handed just to compete in the game. And then as a ping pong player, ping pong came pretty natural. So I'd play with the other hand. But when I took up golf, I didn't know that you couldn't do to the golf ball the same thing you did to the basketball and the ping pong ball. So I never limited how my hands could maneuver the, the paddle or the end of the club face to make the ball spin and do what I wanted the ball to do there for a certain shot. So it's interesting how Mr. Lanning gave me basics. I used my creativity and my short game carried me through my career. Uh, I learned a lot today about why I have a record that you haven't heard about on the PGA Tour. So I have a record you haven't thought of, and I can't get them to quite put this in the book. But I know for a fact that I have the most shots ever hit from off the green for an under par score in nine holes. So do the math in your head. You see, I had six putts and brought it in at one under 35. And think about how bad you got to suck to shoot one under the six pounds. I mean, just mull that over. Now, I probably shouldn't tell that I double chipped a couple times, but that second chip was close. Okay. But it's interesting. I, I love to share these things. I, in, the, in the end, I'm going to make you come down and watch me hit some putts and some chips. I hope I have time to give a couple lessons, but Hank talked about having mentors, and I've had so many, and, and you realize as a tour player, your peers are tour players, and they helped me learn to be a teacher because they would ask me, how did you hit that bunker shot? What were you thinking over the seventh four-foot par putt for the day, you know, or maybe it was 12 foot? But, so I was sharing with my peers as I've moved into your arena, and I would say I've taught a, a good number of golf lessons, nothing like you guys teach, but I've taught a good number of golf lessons since about 2002. Uh, I've developed my, my craft by being mentored by other teachers. So as a player, Mr. Lanning taught me Craig Harrison taught me. The best year I ever played, I was being taught by Fred Griffin at Grand Cypress. I mean, you guys know Fred Griffin and kind of model golf. He's amazing uh, because I shared the stage on Friday in Naples with Rob Akins. Rob Akins has mentored my playing career and my teaching career. He, uh, he validated how good I teach one time, he said, you know, you don't teach near as good as, I, as the rest of us do, but he said, you charge so much, they pay attention to you better. <laughs> <laughs> Try that out, raise your rate. <laughs> Greatest thing that ever happened to my income stream was I let my brother manage the request of lessons. And he raised my rate so much so, it was pretty embarrassing to me so if you came for a lesson and you said, what do I was, I don't know whatever John said. You know, I like playing the uh, kind of dumb card from the hillbilly from the Ozark Mountains. But uh, it's interesting as a kind of, as I continue to try to play some as a teacher, uh, Jim Hardy has had a huge influence on my career. Mike Adams says, you know, I, I don't know anybody that goes out of his way to coach other coaches as hard as Mike does. And I, I know for a fact now that my buddies who I played alongside with took lessons from Mike when I was coming up. And I know they never once mentioned him or introduced me to him for fear I would hit it good. Because <laughs> they couldn't afford me to hit it any better as good as I chipped and putted. But if I'd have met Mike a long time ago, I think I might have stayed on the tour a little longer. Uh, Another person that helps me a lot is E.A. Tischler. 
Uh, some of you may or may not heard of a young man named Shane LeBaron. Uh, if you haven't, I think you will sometime. He's got a great eye for golf. And my point is, the more we hang out and gather information from each other, I think, the better we're going to be. So when I'm in front of a person, I learned a valuable lesson about teaching a couple years ago that was kind of the epiphany of my teaching so far was I was playing a social round of golf with a buddy and I was trying to give him a tip and unfortunately my friend was really bad like if you could do it backwards awkwards he had a groove so I'm giving him this tip and I've said my tip three or four different ways and finally I said so what are you hearing that I'm asking you to do and what he spoke back to me was exactly opposite of what I was trying to say. And my epiphany was, my friend had a belief that would not allow my message to penetrate. You ever do that with your spouse? <laughs> I, I thought I said it clear, but they just don't believe the wavelength you're coming from. But I realize our students have beliefs, whether they're conscious beliefs or subconscious beliefs. If they get in the bunker and they lean back and they dive backwards and swing up, I'm pretty sure they believe they need to lift the ball out of the bunker. I don't know if they'll verbalize that, but they have that belief. And if, if their belief is so strong that they can't hear me, or more particularly, I can't know their belief, it's hard for me to get my message across. So if I have any motto at all, it's best questions wins. So that's kind of how I live my life. Best questions wins. So when I get stumped today and I get up here and I get confused, you guys ask me a question and rev me back up, I'll get to going again. Is that fair? So I've got it on the tip of my tongue. I'm looking back, where am I going to go next? When it doesn't come, you just press on. So if, if I need to know what my student believes, I love to start out like this. If we're, get, if we're about to putt, I may let them hit a couple putts. I kinda, you can see what they do when they set up and they make their first stroke. But here's my question. If your friend comes to you and they've never played golf, and it's your job to teach them putting. We're gonna skip grip posture setup. How would you tell them to make a putting stroke? That's an interesting question, isn't it? I get lots of answers, but the answers I get are pretty revealing. They give me a baseline for where do I go next? How can I give this person my information in a way that he hears me? Uh, so that's something I, I would challenge you to kind of probe your student and see if you can figure out, you know, what is it they're trying to do. Uh, that helps me a lot. It's interesting that I do a number of clinics, so here's my first plug. I live in Scottsdale. From now till May, I'm home a lot. Our weather may not be as good as it is right here, but it's darn good in the winter. So people like to come there and I get busy teaching golf. The rest of the year, I love to travel. So I would love to come to your club and do a clinic. I think the biggest asset for me to come to a clinic at your club would be for your staff to interact, interact with me as I do my clinic. Because if I can tell them one thing that they learn to tell the rest of their students the rest of their life that might influence positively, that could be a good thing. So I'm going to kind of try to run through how I would do a clinic the rest of our time. So my first putting question is, if you face a 15-foot putt to win your championship, so who knows who I've got in my clinic. I could have the best young player in Chicago. I could have a, a student that's trying to break 100. I could have the club champion. Whatever your championship is, 
if you have this 15 foot putt and you could choose anybody in the history of the game in their prime to hit the putt, who would you choose? Would not pick Stan out of here. Leave him off the table. He made one good one. I don't know how you don't pick Jack. Tiger is a pretty good pick. But I was at the 05 British Open. I mean, Jack climbed up on the bridge, bawled his eyes out, took the pictures, went to the 18th hall on Friday afternoon, and made it again. I mean, that's a testament. Now, we could debate his mental capacity to do that, but if we picked, who else are we gonna pick? We got Crenshaw, Tiger, Jack, Tom Watson, Steve Stricker, Jason Day, Poulter, Stockton, we gotta put him on the list. Warren Roberts, NB Park. She may break my rule. But, but if, if we pick all these students and I said, we're going to measure, this is my question in my clinic, we're going to measure the length of their backswing and the length of their through swing, do they match? Or is the through swing shorter or longer? It didn't matter. So I, I felt like I heard a heavy shorter. Are we coaching that? Like it's, it's interesting to me that I don't know that much about golf instruction, but if I had a model, it would kind of be, can we find some similarities of people who make it look easy and do well and, and have them be a reference to maybe teach off of? And I'm not coming at you with all with Sam Putt Lab data. I'm just saying when I watch that group of people that we pick, their follow through looks shorter. I don't know if we teach that or not. I know that the answers I get in my clinic is not shorter very often. The answer I get when I'm watching my student that's paid me a bunch of money for a putting lesson, they're not falling through shorter. They're falling through longer. So the next question I ask, because I've kind of got their attention at this point, because I've blown their mind, they thought they were supposed to fall through, is would a pendulum stroke be a good idea? Now, I'm not talking about the plane, but I'm just talking about would a pendulum stroke be a decent idea? Yeah. Yeah. Most people kind of think it would be. Not everybody, but I do. Here's my logic. The rules of golf have banned the anchor putting at the point they say it's illegal advantage to keep the top of the grip still, I'm thinking that should be our objective. You thought of it like that? I'm not saying the top of the grip is the anchor point. I'm just saying it should have one. And if it has, a, if it has an anchor point on top of the stroke, and we can make it a pendulum stroke, how long would the follow through be if I swung the pendulum relative to the backswing? Pretty similar, right? What if I had a pendulum stroke and I hit a putt? The follow through would be shorter because I collided into a heavy object that's not moving. Mr. Lanning said, putt with dead strength. It's interesting that we've all made big mistakes with our teaching. I have a greatest regret from a teaching standpoint. My greatest regret was I had a father whose son was a wizard around the greens. He was exceptional. His dad wanted me to coach him to have a pretty stroke when he was nine, and I wouldn't do it. And he begged me till he was 10, and I didn't do it. And somewhere around 11, I decided I was, I gave in to the dad. And I gave the kid a stroke. The kid never put a good sense. Breaks my heart. What, did, what happened 
He was a great putter, and he heard something was wrong. We broke his putter spirit. We broke his genius for the sake of a prettier stroke. And I think back about Mr. Lanning. He gave me a putting lesson after my sophomore year in college. That resonates. Like as a kid, I could really make them. I thought I could make them. It doesn't matter whether I did or not. I thought I could make them. I remember making them. That didn't even need to be true, right? That's what I remember. But he waited till I kept, I kind of quit going up, 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 up as a kid, and I kind of leveled out. That's when he gave me a putting lesson. I didn't do that for this young man. It breaks my heart. So sometimes you don't want to interrupt their edge for the sake of better technique till it's time. Uh, so once I have my student realize that if you drop the pendulum, I know where I was going. So Mr. Lanning had Jim Tom Blair give me the putting lesson. And Jim Tom Blair, they, they told me how to grip it. And they gave me a backswing thought. And the most interesting thing about realizing that is when I got out of college, some reason, you know how opposites attract. My traveling buddy on the mini tours was Bramble Chambly. That's a couple opposites. Okay. So Randall called me recently and he told me that he was working on his short game book. So I kind of puffed up and thought it's pretty cool of him to call and ask me what I think. Did not get that question. <laughs> <laughs> he explained to me that his research had found way back when the first guy had talked about the importance of a putting stroke. And you think about it, how important could a putting been in the beginning of golf? They took a bunch of feathers, stitched some leather around them, and put it in the fescue in the weeds. It didn't look like that green out there. Or this is a practice green, smooth as it can be. So anyway, as he tells me this, this guy passed it down, and Bobby Jones passed it down, and Horton Smith passed it down, and Ben Crenshaw. Do you guys, I don't know if this is a fact, but you know Tiger Woods went to Ben Crenshaw for a putting lesson? Doesn't need to be true, it sounds good. <laughs> but Brandall is about to explain to us how it's been passed down, and I'm like, Horton Smith, Horton Smith's from Missouri, that's who Mr. Lanning talked about so much. He talked about Horton Smith and Kyle LaFoon and these guys that grew up and gambled and played great golf in Missouri and Arkansas because Mr. Lanning played with them in tournaments. I thought, I'm in the lineage. So maybe, maybe it got passed down through me. Here I am today. You may be in the lineage next if you believe any of this stuff I'm telling you. But Brandall said one thing. He said, if I go back and I look at all those people that have talked about great putting, he said, if you stop them at the top of the backswing and take the player away, their backswings all look the same. It was interesting. What did Phil say yesterday? We could debate whether we agree with what he said, but he said they all said the same thing to him. And he talked about the backswing. He didn't he ain't worried about the follow through. It's where you get the backswing. That's what they taught me when I was 21. That's what Bramble said his research says. It was pretty fascinating that it would all come full circle and Bramble would figure it out. You can laugh. <laughs> I love him. In spite of what he says. So if we think it should swing on a pendulum, or it should have pendulum energy, what Mr. Lanning and Jim Tom call dead strength. My next question to my students is, if the pendulum swings, at what point in the through swing does maximum acceleration occur? Just don't say after impact, or I'll abuse you. I get that all the time, I'm like, 
There's no point in accelerating after an impact. What's that? When does maximum acceleration occur? Come on, you guys. You guys all got sand pot labs. Very start. Early. When I turn loose. Early. That's why we don't teach putting better. You see, I didn't say club head speed. Some of you are answering the question you heard correctly. I said acceleration. Okay? It's not constant either. No, it's not. It's greatest at the start of the drop. Now, why would I feel confident in that? The same reason that if I speak with authority today, if I sound like I speak with authority, it's only because I believe wholeheartedly in the people I got my information from. Right? It doesn't have much to do with me. I'm confident in the people I hang out with. So my son, Jake, just turned 21, and he ended up working on his mechanical engineering degree at Cal Poly up in San Luis Obispo. And one of the professors up there is somebody you guys know and have heard of, Tom Mace. Anybody know Tom Mace? A few of you do. So Tom is kind of a genius engineer in the golf world. Now I go, when I, when I go visit Jake, I stay at Tom's house. So I asked Tom about this. Am I telling it right about when acceleration happens? So the next thing I know, Tom's drawing me a picture on a napkin. Well, it's greatest at the start because the more downward the club is moving, the heavier the gravity is pulling. So I, I've seen sand pot lab data, didn't have any idea what it meant. My acceleration charts at the start of the downswing spikes, flat lines descending. That's what Faxon's looks like. Lots of good putters look like that. That's what Lauren looks like, okay? Why does it look like that? Because the closer the, ball, the club gets to the ground, the more level it is to the ground, the less inter, uh, gravity's pulling. The, the acceleration in a free fall is actually decelerating. Club head speed's increasing. And my belief is why great putters swing through smaller is the energy gets delivered into the ball. People have always told me, wow, you're a pop stroke putter. My stroke is opposite from a pop stroke. Completely opposite. My stroke is dead weight. It's a free fall. It looks like a pop because the ball interrupts it so dramatic, drastically. Think about how far Tiger Woods falls through. How about Jason Day? Nobody mentioned Jason Day. He's got great putting stats. He hardly ever falls through past his left foot. I'm not saying there are any exceptions, but it's interesting how that works. So, you guys ready to stand in the sun a little bit? I think better when I'm hitting shots. All right, come on. Does that make sense? You guys are the gifted teachers around here. Pay attention to what you see. That might be the best thing I could share with you today. It's interesting. I thought of what I couldn't think of in there a while ago was, uh, I know what my defining moment was. Like if, if, if it may have, may have happened to you, it may not have happened to you yet, but there was a moment in time that changed my life for the better. And it would be wrong if I didn't share it because I owe so much to this person, but I was sitting on a picnic table eating barbecue with Jay Haas, and we were sitting at Dillard Pruitt's house. Anybody remember Dillard Pruitt? He wanted to event. It was pretty funny. Um, when we came out of college in 1984, Dillard and Fred Wadsworth traveled, and Brandall and I traveled. So we had Missouri. Nobody ever heard of Missouri as a golf school. Texas, South Carolina, and Clemson represented. And we went to everywhere. We would drive those four cars and grab hotel rooms and play practice rounds. And uh, pretty cool thing. All four of us got a tour win. Fred won, a, won the Southern Open on a Monday qualifying spot. I don't know if you know anything about my history, but I was not on tour. I got an exemption. I played the Kansas Open, the Missouri Open, got an 
exemption into a turbine one. I didn't even know where the next stop was. Mm. I did make it though. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> the fighting moment, thank you for pulling me back. <laughs> so I, I made the barbecue at Dillard's house. And I'm sitting next to Jay Haas and we're acquaintances. He, he grew up near Missouri. We knew who each other were, but we're not like buddies. And he says, what are you up to? This was in 2001. And then 2000 was the only year Jay Haas didn't finish in the top 125. So he was 51 or something. So I said, well, I'm trying to play, but a lot of guys are asking me for help. The next thing I knew, we were out in behind the barn at Dillard's house under a, a light with maybe a six iron and Jay's making strokes and honestly I don't even remember what I told him but I know about three or four days later my phone rang my wife's <laughs> over here in the passenger seat and I'm like Jay Haas is calling me <laughs> and Jay Haas changed my life from that moment on he putted so nice that it really frustrated his friends <coughs> and it didn't take me another couple of years that I had somebody share with me what the word brand means. If you ever have your own brand, hang on to it. Because I had a businessman explain to me that I had a brand. I didn't even know what it was. He said my brand was, I taught tour players and the average guy couldn't take a lesson from me. You know what that brand does? It makes pricing irrelevant. They would pay anything. So, I'm not saying I didn't feel weird charging them, but I went ahead and charged them, and they still came. <laughs> so I'm grateful. It changed my life, because if you hit the most shots for nine holes for very long, you go in so much debt, you need to make a lot of money a different way. I know what that one tour win did for me. It created a drug that was hard to get off of. I did it again two weeks ago. I got back on the drug. I had status. Do you know how hard it is to quit when you have status? I could have stayed on that web.com tour forever probably because I had status. The only problem was I kept going $3,000 in the hole every week. Not every month, every week I'm losing another three grand. So that's what the mini tour does for you. <laughs> so if we want to swing the pendulum, we want to have it freed up. I went back after Brandel called me and I said, my wife bought me Horton Smith's book that was written in 1958 or nine on putting. So I go back and I look at this book. In this book, it has the quote that defines what I'm going to share the rest of the day. It says, Sir W.G. Simpson, The Art of Golf, 1887. <coughs> that's the quote that's in Horton Smith's book. It says, good putting can be done by the wrist, the shoulders, here's what I teach, or a combined use of all arm joints. I was like, there it is in writing. Horton Smith's book, Mr. Lanning learned from him, this is what I teach. A combined use of all arm joints. We don't want the medical people to get involved in this question too much because we don't want to think, overthink it, but how many arm joints do we have? Three. Times two. Six. Let's go with the wrist, an elbow, and a shoulder joint. How do we use those? Well, do your wrist like this. This is mostly be putting. I wouldn't want to go up and down much on putting. Here's my elbow. My elbows can move and my shoulders can move. Everybody hold your arms like this. Go for a little mini job. You need to move your chest to do this. Okay, you ever have a student come to you and say, I can't get my head to quit moving, right? Some of the group here is like, my head moves. I've never had a student whose head move like this. <laughs> their whole body moved. It wasn't their head moving, their whole body was moving because they had no joint mobility. See, if I could get my student to stand out here and swing this club with a little bit of wrist and a little bit of elbows and a little bit of shoulders. I'm trying to look to see if I'm standing still. 
I'm not moving much. Now I can free it up to let the pendulum drop. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If I can let the joint swing, my club kind of goes on plane. Now I gotta figure out what's the most important thing when it comes to being successful on the putting green. And if I gave you two options, I'd say speed or distance. Speed, I think we would agree speed. Not taking anything away from uh, you. Know, how that's my swing. I would only aim square to the front of the tee. If I was practicing my swing, practicing aim is a different thing. But it's hard to have the tee go this way and you point and hit balls that way. That's difficult. So if I can get my student to quit looking over here, I see him come over here like this. <laughs> so I just walk up and stand parallel. Then sit, I, I set my putter down and then look. That's one tip I got. And, and, I, and I will say this, I've, I've had weeks I've putted great when I can see the line. And I've had weeks I didn't putt good seeing the line. And I've had my most one of my most memorable putting weeks, I could not see the line. And I don't know why I couldn't see the line, to answer your question honestly. But even though I couldn't see the line, I trusted that, you know, I walk in and stand here and point my putter pretty good. I'm just going to go with my process. I trust my process. I made them that week until I realized I had three putting. <laughs> I went like almost three rounds. I didn't get to go four rounds even though I putted good. But that was a pebble one year. But I, I putted it up like this and, and my brain said, oh, you haven't three putted all week. When I missed that four footer for a three putt, I was like, I basically told myself I was proud because I had done just exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> As we all understand, your brain does not hear the word don't. No three putt simply screams three putt, three putt, three putt, three putt. <laughs> I had done exactly what I'd put my, in my brain. Do you like to, uh, is there a specific routine that you try and give it to them, or is it something that you want them to develop on their own? So I talk, one, I'm a believer in swing thoughts. So I'm not into blank. Now I'm learning about quiet mind. I think I quiet my mind with my swing thoughts. I get to that state, but I don't go blank, blank, blank. I go wrist and back, let it go. I got swing thoughts. So I, 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 there's a place in the routine for swing thoughts, but I teach them that they need to learn to walk in. They have a pattern of, we'll call it a habit of how they walk in. And then I also mentioned the idea that I would want a pattern of thought. You guys ever had Dr. David Cook come speak? You need to have David Cook at your summit. Yeah, I just recommend that. But I've had two primary sports psychologists in my career. The first guy was a track coach who said, I'm gonna meet, introduce you to my friend, the golf coach. Both these guys, Rick and David, were Rattel's first two students. They're the first two people that got their doctorate under Rotella, so they go way back. But David, literally, he gave me the see it, feel it, trust it routine. Many of you guys have seen that in the, watched the movie or read his books. I was the movie. Like, I, I am the movie. I went, met David Cook in Kansas Open. They literally walked around and jingled their change and talked while I played the Kansas Open. I got so angry at David and Rick. They were like, well, if you'd done your routine, you wouldn't hurt us. <laughs> the next week they came, played with me at the Missouri Open, which I won. And the next week I won a tournament right after meeting David Cook, just like the book. So anyway, to see it, feel it, trust it, just gives me a routine mentally of going visualize, feel, trust, and go. So I teach that to my students. They can use their own words, they can use their own step hands, but, but it's good for us to know what it is we do. Do you do much with eye dominance? I don't. Dr. Farnsworth. Right. We got a guy for that. Yep. 
So, just in general, I would say if I have if I have putting drills, I can't tell you how many putts I've made from this far. Like it never made sense for me to practice from here as far as being the primary practice. Because if I practice from here to here and I made them all, I would never miss that putt. I don't hit this putt any harder than that putt. So I, I just keep practicing the one I make. And then I take a ball or two and I practice long putts and just circle the green. Just keep hitting distance putts. Now, I feel like if, if my student is having trouble with those long putts, I gotta coach his technique. So there's some technique coaching into hitting long putts. Using this horn foot putter is amazing for getting people to feel the load and unload of the shaft. So that's kind of the drills I use. Um, do you know bloodline putters? No. There's either pain putters or they're off brand putters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I just, just wanted to get that out and make that clear. First time my dad met Randall Chambly, that was his number one question. Randall was playing Blade, Ram, Tom Watson's Irons. My dad had never met the boy before. He's an all American, on all these calls. My dad asked him why he played off brand clubs. <laughs> that putter back, the ball would keep going the same distance. That's the math. But once again, if you can train the backstroke and let it go, it gets easier. So should we chip? Uh, yeah. <laughs> One more question. So the question was, what do I do before a tournament round? I had one of those the other day, so some of you has asked me, do I still compete? I played one Monday qualifier this year, and uh, the fact that I've taken all these swing lessons still hasn't worked. <laughs> it's going to. I got one from my class now. I don't know if you stuck around long enough, but I, I don't know if Scott's still here, but I really need a lesson from Scott, because I think we can figure it out if I got one from him. But I went and played, and my routine would be I usually putt, then I chip, then I hit balls, then I putt right before I go to the tee. So that's kind of been my history. How long do I have? All day. 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. All right. Chipping will be quicker. about line on the ball or no line? So I've always, you guys notice these new ping balls I'm playing? <laughs> I would only ride ping on the titles person. <laughs> but I use the Pro B logo. I've always set it down and I would say I pay very little attention to it. I got a laser one time, got my laser out, worked on my alignment. The worst chewing out I've ever gotten in golf. I'm down in Memphis with my friend Rob Akins, and that's when I was still chasing the tour, and he saw me with that laser, man. He come and wore me out. He said, what in the world are you doing? I said, well, I don't aim straight. He said, you never aim straight. You always aim to the left. I'm like, that's what the laser said. <laughs> How do you putt? Putt pretty good. He said, why are you trying to aim straight? So I never had a, a line on my putter. Why would I want a line? I don't aim straight. <laughs> so I was over at Scotty's studio, and I saw it playing his day. It kind of goes back, don't tell Phil, it goes back a little hooded because it's aimed left. And then right at the top, it laid down. 
just like them good swings they're talking about. Wish I could do that with that five iron. <laughs> Laid down and then it went dead perfect on the arc with the face square to the path all the way through to head square. The Sam Putlap guys found out. I mean, there's almost no good tour player that aims well. The best, the best math on Sam Putt Lab of any student I've ever taught. Guess who that is? You don't know who I taught. <laughs> who gets the worst rap of money on TV? Sergio. Sergio by far has the best looking stroke anybody I've ever taught on the Sam Putt Lab. I've never really been asked to help Sergio with his putty. Everybody assumes when I'm on his team, I'm helping him with his putty. He struggles with easy chips. Like people who are on TV all the weekends don't putt bad. The guys who putt bad went home on Friday. You don't see them. <laughs> like great ball strikers get wrapped for putting bad. Like Tom Lehman doesn't putt bad. He hits it 14 to 18 feet every hole. You see him putt a lot. You show somebody else hit every 14 footer. It looks like they missed two. When we saw Sergio with the, except for Bernard. Sorry. With the orange whip at Augusta, practicing with it. Is that you that got into it? I mean, here's the guy that we all know has more lag pressure than anybody. I've seen any chips. Wonder, wonder that, what we're working on. That was mind blowing. That was cool. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that I have had can't say that's recent, but I've had a lot of wives, agents, and caddies call me to teach tour players, or kids. It does not do any good unless the player asks you to help them. So I think it was 08, I got a call from Billy Foster, who was Darren's old caddy, wanted me to come teach Sergio. So I meet Sergio at the match play in 08, and so my first question is, are you interested in me giving you a lesson? Because I've, I've come at the request of a caddy. And that, went, that year went good. And, you know, regrets in your career. I regret that his first almost marriage broke up right in the, right in the middle of me having a good run teaching him. Because when Norman's daughter broke up with him, it was, it was tough emotionally for him. So we had a bunch of years we didn't work. And he called me last year. And it was interesting. I got this text message exchange on a Friday night. I'm sitting in my house. I'm like, he's text back. It wasn't until like two hours later I'm watching Golf Channel. He's in second in Mexico. It was the week in front of, in front of uh, Tampa. I think Phil won that tournament. Is that right? So, see, it's, sorry, he beat Sergio. But he's calling for a chip unless I get to Tampa. Oh, by the way, I cleared my schedule to go see him. And uh, Glenn's like, we lost six shots the first two days, chipping the line. So it's just like, but, but that transition and, 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 and ex sets late, you would say, mm -hmm. it's not that good for chipping. Mm -hmm. The late set's bad for chipping. So if I get the shaft back in front of him, he chips better. 